Okay, hi everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Jill Dupre, and I'm the Associate Director of the Atlas Institute. Atlas leads discovery and innovation at the intersection of technology and society. Our speaker series brings technologists, performers, academics, and innovative thinkers to campus as a way to start conversations and look at the ways in which technology is shaping society and vice versa. The Atlas Speaker Series is made possible by a generous donation from Adit Harel Caperton and Anat Harel. This week we are so pleased to welcome Ga Wang from Stanford University, where he is an assistant professor in the Center for Computer Research in Music and Acoustics. Ga is also an innovator, entrepreneur, programmer, and co-founder of the music making app company Smule. We're excited to hear Gus share his experiences with laptop and mobile phone orchestras, computer music languages such as Chuck, music apps including Ocarina and Magic Piano, and his thoughts on the exciting space where computers, music, and people interact. Gus has been extremely generous with his time here at CU Boulder. In addition to today's in addition to today's talk, he will be visiting with Tam and David Shaw's digital sound and physical computing classes, Atlas graduate students, members of the CU College of Music, and Blork, the Boulder Laptop Orchestra. Join me in thanking Gu for his generosity and for his talk today. Thank you very much. Hey everyone, how's it going? Right. Um, I just got off a plane not too long ago. Uh, well, from San Francisco, but like right before that from Beijing. So I'm a little bit delirious from uh, prolonged jet lag. <coughs> also, I got this uh, lingering cough. So I got this uh, row of cough drops in front of me that I'm going to be just popping throughout the uh, next hour or so. So uh, hope you'll uh, hope you don't mind. I'm going to pop one right now. And uh, all right. Hopefully, this will suppress the coughing. Um, I'll just jump right in. I guess uh, I'll kind of start at the beginning. Um, <laughs> that's my grandparents. Uh, I, I, I grew up in, I was born in Beijing, and I grew up with my grandparents until I was nine. Um, I guess they're responsible for a, a number of things that I, I, I'm very thankful for, um, one of which is just not really pushing me into any particular thing of their choosing or liking, but kind of always encouraging me to figure out what it is that, you know, I'm interested in doing. Uh, but they weren't also, they also weren't afraid to suggest things, one of which was uh, the accordion. So when I was seven, that was, that became my first musical instrument. Um, this, this hotshot accordion teacher rolled into Beijing and said, hey, parents, grandparents, your kids need to learn the accordion today. He was a very good, uh, very good salesman. And, uh, and I became like one of his like first students. Um, so every week my grandfather would lug, you know, this accordion that's about as heavy as I was and, uh, to, um, to class. And, uh, that was, you know, that was my first musical instrument. Um, at the age of nine, I moved to the United States, uh, to be with my parents. Um, and they, you know, I think continued in much the same vein of just, you know, trying to make sure I have a good education, but never really pushing me into any any specific thing, but always, just, you know, trying to explore. And they saw that I really like music, but they also didn't, you know, didn't say, hey, you gotta, you gotta learn the violin, you gotta learn the piano, you gotta learn the arhu or the pipa or anything like that. And, um, but for 13th, my 13th birthday, they did give me an electric guitar out of the blue. That was a kind of a turning point. I don't think I've asked, I didn't ask for this thing. And in retrospect, that you know, I, I think in terms of, I think it's a pretty brilliant parenting move to uh, preemptively buy your child the uh, the very instrument of rebellion, and uh, and if you do that, I think preemptively uh, without them asking, I think it kind of takes the fun out of rebelling. Therefore, I never did rebel, and I was kind of a pretty pretty good kid, and um, but I loved playing the guitar. It was awesome, uh, and I played everything from folk to heavy metal and uh it, it was kind of the instrument that i really kind of fell in love with as, as a as an instrument um but also it gave me a chance to really 
I think, look and listen more deeply into into music in general. Um, and uh, you know, kind of fast forwarding to today, I'm now I'm actually rather confused as to what it is exactly that I'm doing because I, I think I don't really know what I'm doing. That's that's pretty much you know, it's, that's definitely the truth. But you know, uh, whatever it is I'm doing, I, I really I, I just know that I really like it. I love it. Um, New York Times had, at some point tried to capture what it is that I'm doing, and apparently this is their notion. And uh, <coughs> apparently I'm trying to get like random people to play music into the streets, just go in the streets and just play music. And in some ways, that's actually not far from from the truth. And that's that is, I think, a mission to try to. Uh, get more people to play more music because uh, I guess I don't really believe there's quite a ceiling where uh, you know at some at, at which point we say you know hey the world now has enough music we can just like tone it down a bit I, I think that you really can't make enough music but more on that later we'll come back to this um, <coughs> I studied computer science in in undergrad and I went to grad school in computer science studying computer music um, this machine actually was uh, in, in in mainstream use, if you call it that. Actually, before I, you know, way before I went to college, it was the IBM 360. is one of the first machines, um, one of the earlier machines to use to synthesize sound. Definitely not the first by far. Um, and uh, in some ways, you know, in, in grad school, I discovered kind of the intersection of computing and music, whereas before I kind of did the two separately. Um, and, and this machine is one of the machines that I think were also at this intersection. Um, and partly, of course, for the reason that computers have always been deemed interesting or intriguing for sound and music because of their precision, their programmability, their, therefore, you know, their opportunity for fantastical automations. Um, you know, Lady Lovelace in 1843 predicted that, you know, we're going to be making scientific music with computers one day. And, uh, you know, a little more than 100 years later, you know, we were doing just that. Um, so um, what I ended up doing in, in grad school was working on this, this language called Chuck. Uh, it's a music programming language. You can use it to, to write code that turns basically like ASCII characters you type in into sound and not always the sound that you're hoping for but you know it turns it's, it synthesizes sound by generating digital numbers that becomes this digital series then it gets converted into what we hear as sound um, I think I'm going to give more in depth you know kind of a um, discussion of Chuck tomorrow in the digital sound class but I'll give you a quick demo here um, Chuck is open source and is freely available on all platforms and I always like to say that it, it crashes equally well on all platforms and so beware of that. Um, let's see, so, so with Chuck you can basically uh, create this thing, a sign oscillator for example, and uh, make everything just a little bigger so it can be seen. Use this chuck operator to chuck it to the DAC, which is the abstraction for basically the sound out. It's the digital analog converter. And we basically patch this oscillator into the speaker. And uh, this is actually a valid chuck program, but uh, it doesn't actually make any sound because in chuck, it, you have to, in order to make sound, you have to deal with time. And if you think about it, of course, it kind of makes sense in that without the passage of time, we wouldn't be able to really perceive sound. It's, it, it is a time-based medium, uh, perhaps unlike, you know, a still photography or a painting, um, at least, you know, kind of at this, uh, at the basic level. So we could advance time by, say, one second by chucking that duration to this magical now. And if we do that, we hear the sine oscillator for one second. I'm going to basically, I think that was a 220. I'm going to change the frequency of sine oscillator by an octave to 440. And uh, we hear that. And you can basically use this to construct um, simple straight line programs. Start at 220 for five seconds, go to 440 for five seconds, and end with 880. 
another doubling of the frequency to the next octave. If we do this, you get this sequence of tones. Um, now, you can imagine in a very painstaking manner writing music in this fashion, but uh, of course one of the nice things about computers is that it doesn't get tired and we can instruct it to, uh, to basically repeat and loop. So, um, let's go ahead and wrap this wild true loop here. You don't actually have to indent, but I always do because it's a good habit. And um, if you do this, it's going to just repeat that. It's going to repeat that for a, like a really long time. And if I don't stop it, so uh, I, I think you'll believe me when I when I when I tell you that. Um, <laughs> until Chuck crashes, that's probably the most likely endpoint, uh, other than just removing the shred. Um, so. Here we already have this way to kind of continually introduce some dynamic behavior into, into this. But let's simplify or maybe make it slightly more interesting by generating a random number between 30 and 1,000 and chucking that to the frequency every second. And by the way, <coughs> how many people here uh, program or programmers? Okay, so like a good number of you. And uh, if you're not, do not worry because uh, I think you can also follow along. Chuck is meant to be a language that, you know, it's... Programming shouldn't have to be, you know, in my in, in my mind, it shouldn't have to be hard. It's 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 at the same time, programming is a very should be a very fun and creative thing. And at the same time, you know, in creating a programming language, one of the goals is to make it as easy as possible um, to to discern what is going on by looking at the code. In this case, you know, Chuck tries to make the um, the equivalence between time and sound. So in this case, you just read from the top. You have, you basically connect the sound making thing. It goes into this loop that's going to loop forever. And every time it loops, it's going to execute these two lines. And whatever this does, it's going to essentially wait for one second before moving on to the next part of the loop. That's all really. That's really all there is to to Chuck. And that's really one of the main tenets of the Chuck programming language. Um, so by the way, I should caveat something I just said, which is making things easy. It's, uh, um, I always avoid using the word intuitive because, like to me, intuitive often too often means intuitive for the creator of the thing, and maybe only for the creator of the thing. So, uh, um, so but Chuck definitely fall potentially falls in that as well. But uh, nonetheless, um, we do subject the world to Chuck and all its uh, pitfalls. So in any case, uh, if we do this, we'll get this marginally more interesting and possibly even less, ex you know, digestible sound. But let's go ahead and speed things up a bit. Let's do this every half a second. Or let's do this every 100 milliseconds, 10 times a second. And, uh, whoops. Get that. And at this point, I always think, you know, I always think this of this as kind of the canonical computer music. Like this is what mainframes and computers should be. The sound they should be making when they're like thinking really hard. Um, let's continue. If we do this a thousand, uh, wait, a hundred times a second, we kind of get this thing. <coughs> a thousand times a second, you kind of get this carpet of sound. I'm just going to mute that for a second. And uh, somewhere between, you know, doing this 10 times a second and doing this about 100 times a second, um, we should cross an interesting perceptual threshold. And that's the threshold where individual events, when we pack enough of those together in time, we start perceiving those not no longer as individual events, but as kind of a continuum. So in this case, you know, it's, it makes makes sense that, you know, randomizing this frequency a thousand times a second gives us that. And uh, Chuck is capable of really kind of precisely handling time. And that's kind of when it's, um, I would say one of few, you know, shining points it has like a hundred times more like, you know, roadblocks and, and, and kind of gutters that you could fall into. But, um, 
one thing it does well is is time. And in fact, you can you can actually change the frequency once every digital sample, of which there are 44,100 in this particular running of Chuck. And that's how many samples are in a second on, on a CD. And if we do this, it sounds like... That's an interesting signal for maybe just one reason. Um, it's actually, you can think of it as having two components. One is this noisy component, which you would expect because we're randomizing so much. You, hear this. you also hear this whistle-like sound. And it turns out the whistle-like sound is at the frequency that is uh, at the average of the bounds of this linear <coughs> distribution that we're pulling this random number out of. Now, that's the kind of thing you can experiment with with Chuck because you can really zoom into time and sample or even less if you want and talk about time very precisely in that manner. And uh, going back up, um, that guy, that guy, it's like the computer going blah, 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 blah. and then uh, let's see, um, this guy, 1000. And basically, we can just keep going. You know, there's a second, there's a minute. I will not attempt to play this. This will take a long time. Um, there's an hour, there's a day, there's a week. And at this point, we kind of like, you know, Chuck kind of doesn't provide any more default durations. You kind of have to build your own. Because if you think about it, like a month is, um, well, that's not, not all months that are of this equal duration. So that's, that's a problem. Some people suggest a fortnight. Is a, another like a Chuckian duration. Um, we're still working on that, and uh, but you can actually say you know 52 week is my notion of a year, and then you can say you know 1,000 year is my notion of a millennium. So and Chuck kind of allows you to also build up in one particular type of thinking about about time. Um, you know uh, your own units of working with time. And something that is so crucial to making sound, um, in 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 this manner, you know, um, you know, this is, you know, when Chuck is being designed and is still being designed, you know, I thought it would take like you know a few months, a few years maybe, and it, and every feature I thought would take no more than two weeks, and all of which is just totally wrong. Now I'm still working on it, like ten years later, and a lot of other people are as well, and it feels like we are. You know, even farther from being done. That's okay. It's evolving. Um, but through it all, I think more than anything, I, I didn't really think of this as a program language. I kind of thought of it as a as a kind of as a human computer interaction. And, you know, it, we tend to think of programming languages as kind of this very cold, logical thing that we do to have to instruct computers. Instead, you know, uh, we try to think of Chug as as just kind of a, as another, you know mode of interactions, another thing, another interface, and uh, as an HCI device, as HCI element. And uh, in some ways, it's kind of putting, trying to put people first, in term, and not so much the technology first. And at the end of the day, you're still trying to do the same thing, trying to get the computer to do what you want it to do. In any case, um, that's a little bit taste of Chuck. Um, there's a lot more to the horrors of Chuck that I will probably ex um, explain more tomorrow. Um, so back to the slide. So <coughs> while, we're just, while we were uh, cranking on Chuck, um, the Princeton Laptop Orchestra was, was started in 2005 uh, by professors Dan Truman and Perry Cook. Um, Perry was my advisor, and Dan was essentially my advisor in music, and they've, you know, just wonderful mentors. And I was very fortunate to be kind of um, the one of the founding developers of this, of trying to figure out, you know, how to build a laptop orchestra, how to teach one, and what kind of music we can make with this, and how to create instruments for it, and how to just run the thing, and and also how to teach it as a kind of this course that combined everything from computing, programming, sound design, composition, to live performance. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think this is the part where I think embracing 
not, you know, the fact that we didn't know what we're doing really kind of helped. And I, I think if, from this, from that point on, I kind of felt really comfortable with just realizing I have no idea what I'm doing when doing something new. And, <coughs> and for that, I'm very, quite thankful. And, uh, you know, when I started at Stanford uh, in 2007, uh, I brought kind of the Laptop Orchestra idea over and we had the Stanford Laptop Orchestra, you know, at Plork, the Slork, and, of course, we've got Blork here. So uh, it, it's a happy lineage of, of crazy laptop orchestras. And um, I'm very happy to see that it's kind of just springing up and uh, everywhere, and especially in a wonderful place like this and looking forward to doing some blorking tomorrow. Um, now, I'll give you a little bit of uh, background on kind of the Stanford version, where we actually fashioned our speaker arrays out of salad bowls from Ikea. Um, and uh, it seemed like a thing to do. Video. We actually went through several iterations of design. It turns out this size and form factor of salad bowl was better. We tried metal salad bowls. We tried kind of this pyramid-like thing that was way too big, but sounded pretty good. This is a good balance. But basically, it, it took a long time. We had to, you know, drill six holes into each salad bowl, and this is uh, just one hole, one out of 120. We went through like five different of these, uh, these, these drills. It's pretty satisfying once you, you know, kind of like this is basically what we spent spring break doing. Okay. That's one. Nick has worked out this way of just like. And then it turned out, oh, whoops, this hole was just slightly like smaller than it needed to be. So, um,. We had to do a little bit extra dremeling and, and the like. It's spectacular. Yeah, it's pretty good. He said, uh, Lawrence, in his usual calm delivery, said, well, that was less than spectacular. Uh, I think another dremel was just burned out. Um, but after some weeks of this, we had ourselves 20 of these you know, speakers that looked like it came from the top of R2-D2. And I uh, was able to deliver six channels of independently addressable sound, and uh, which you know, went into the laptop orchestra. And uh, you know, here we have the Stanford Laptop Orchestra performing uh, at Tinker Spiel Auditorium on campus with the Stanford New Ensemble on stage with musicians from Beijing through the Soundwire program. Um, and uh, you know, this is since I think since probably 2005, laptop orchestras just you know, the Plorks, the Blorks, the Slorks. There's one called Bile from Birmingham. There's a Lowell Laptop Orchestra of Louisiana. Um, you know, there's, there, there are many. Yeah, I think they have premiered and performed hundreds of new pieces of music um, in this totally new medium and created probably just about as many instruments, um, new instruments out of laptops. Um, I'll give you a few more uh, just play this excerpts of, of slorks could be an idea of some more some instruments <laughs> and pieces that have been created. This is a handbell like instrument created using the game track controller. Jeffrey, do you guys are you guys using game tracks here yet? All right, we might have to send you some. Yeah, we bought like a hundred of them, which came on this big pallet. And then they, apparently they wanted to get rid of them, so we got a second pallet for free. They really wanted to get rid of them. Um, but we now have too many, so we will, we'll, we'll be happy to hook you up. These things are basically tethers that come from the base on the ground, and the tracks the position of your two hands in 3D. So um, it's very, such a versatile and uh, frankly kind of addicting um, kind of a device to work with. This is a piece called Monk We See, Monk We Do that involves the Wiimote, imitation, and chanting. Hence this triple pun of a title, Monk We See, Monk We Do. 
is pretty horrible. Um, there's the monk. The imitation's not very apparent here, but obviously there's the Wiimote. This is a piece simply called Barrel, and because it features kind of this instrument built out of a barrel with like eight, eight game tracks duct taped, um, you definitely have an aesthetic to it. Um, and it was played like a collaborative eight-person harp that was conducted by someone standing on top of the barrel. piece called Converge. It's uh, made using cell phones capturing hundreds of images, capturing hundreds of images um, and sound and GPS tagging their location. Um, and then we basically put them all into the central blender that blends the image and the sound. Um, and it's meant to kind of be an exploration of just the mundane moments of life. Of, of memory um, and of, of location and time. Um, let's see, moving forward, this is a. We'll go back a bit. Here are three three more instruments created using game tracks. All very different. They're all air instruments. That, of course, is an air harp. That is a upright bass. So basically, he's changing the frequency by pulling on the bass string, which makes sense. And of course, here, you can imagine the strings of the harp laid out before you, and you're just strumming through them, plugging through them. And air drums, which frankly didn't work that well, which is, which is why the video kind of ends right there. Okay, this is kind of game track overload. This is a headbang orchestra created with game tracks. People now tie the game tracks tethered to their head, and uh, they're headbanging, and the sensors are picking this up. Basically, when they shake their head or kind of tilt their head to the side, it's actually like a whammy bar action right there. And then there's kind of this, uh, this moment here in the solo, and maybe it's do it. Also game tracks. piece actually this is Chris Schaaf. Uh, this piece Electro this is actually playing with an ensemble it's not on stage but actually through the internet and their sound is actually coming out of this orchestra being manipulated and processed and the sound is, sending, is sent back to them in this telematic performance. Um, this is a piece based on tweeting. Um, the audience could actually be part of the performance just by tweeting with special hashtags and, uh, and there are different semantic analysis happening on the tweets um, and it is essentially sonifying this very small part of Twitter. Um, this is an instrument called Intervallus playing a oh so familiar tune. It's using the accelerometer inside the MacBook also the keyboard and so this you know to, I guess too often we see like laptop performers just huddled behind the laptop and wondering what they're doing so this is kind of uh, trying to make it more physical this is a piece uh, based on the quick 3 engine and uh, it's Rob Hamilton's piece called uh, we're all Fernando and basically all the players are avatars inside this game and, uh, and sonifying their actions. 
this ch- this like thing that is is shooting at is actually um, a speaker and a corresponding speaker with sound. This is a live coding piece. Um, this is these instructions issued by the conductor, and everyone, including the audience, sees this. And this is a piece called Claire de Lupe. It's actually uh, Claire de Lune being granularly synthesized. And uh, I think he just auto-corrected because he just couldn't type incrementally. So all these little things, these nuances, are actually being picked up by, by the audience and the performer, and it becomes part of the performance. It's So this this is just a you know just a small cross section of, of Sanford laptop orchestra and an even smaller cross section of laptop orchestra, um, and you know it's such a great platform for experimenting with with music and uh, especially with interaction and instruments, um, which brings me really to kind of this this question, which I think perhaps is always good to ask. Um, Because it just has a lot of answers. What is an instrument? Um, You know, we can can think of you know the laptop, this phone, these iPads. Are they instruments? Um, You know, maybe in another fashion. If I take this, you know, this 1715 Stradivarius violin, um, I put it. You know, you put it in my hands. I don't know how to play the violin. To me, that's like putting a sweater in my hands, and I'm not going to really be able to really play much with it. It's, you know, is that an instrument? To me, at that point, it's kind of just this very amazingly, you know, valuable um, historical wooden box. On the other hand, you know, you have people with just cans and sticks making amazing music. Um, so I think the definition for instrument to me is is never set. It's uh, it's always it's changing. Though there's some things that to me always seem to be common for something that we think of as an instrument. One of them is just this this notion of being expressive. I feel like if you can make something expressive, then that's a beginning of of an instrument. Um, and that's kind of a a definition that's pretty simple, but I think you can go pretty pretty deep with it too. Um, because if you can, if these sticks and cans can be an instrument, a musical instrument, you know, might not these, you know, very sophisticated, powerful, um, computers that we now hold in our hands, take with us wherever we go, you know, might they not also be musical instruments? Um, so it's, you know, with these ideas in mind from the laptop orchestra, from working with software systems for, for music, and plus like this this bout of insanity that you know I, I co-founded a company in 2008. That's Mule, and we started exploring, you know, creating musical sonic things for for the then you know really new iPhone and this whole new concept, at least to you know the population is you know the app. Um, again, you know, commonality with the laptop orchestra. It was such a great time because. You kind of knew, like deep down, that nobody knew what the hell was going on, and nobody knew what was what what, was, what they were doing. Like no one knew what an app should be, or you know, or how to make one, how to market one, how to make people get people to use one. Um, so people were just experimenting, um, and I think this medium of the app is still still young. It's only like four years in, as though it seems like it's been here forever. Um, but um, but you know, I feel like now things have kind of settled down a little bit, and people have these like best practices and things, and those are those are useful. Um, but there was something like back in the good old days, you know, that summer of '08 when the app store just went online, and, and all so, sorts of crazy apps were just being you know experimented on, and and some really surprising ones became very popular. You know, some of you might remember the. The sound grenade. Someone apparently apparently spent 20 minutes creating this app that basically just sounds like a grenade exploding. That became a number one like download a free app. There was you know the uh, mirror. That was a pretty good one. 
it just puts a frame on the order and around your iPhone screen and you basically use the reflection to see yourself. It's a good one. <coughs> um, we made things like Sonic Lighter, um, and uh, a few months later we made Ocarina, which is probably, you know, one of the first apps people really kind of found smooth through. So I'm going to actually switch audio here to my iPhone and um, give you a little demo of this. Um, so this is created as uh, another kind of a physical interaction um, in this, for the iPhone. And uh, the idea is just to change the iPhone into kind of this wind instrument, kind of this flute-like thing. And it tries to, it was kind of an exercise in trying to use all the things that are on an iPhone, that's on an iPhone, or at least was on an iPhone at the time, and there are like a lot more now. Uh, multi-touch, so you can use multi-touch to change the fingering, giving you different pitches. Um, use the microphone for articulation, so I'm actually blowing into the microphone at the bottom of the iPhone, and uh, <coughs> it's actually a little chuck program that's running inside Ocarina that's tracking the energy of the signal, and if, you know, to the computer, to at least to this little program, uh, blowing to the microphone really is no different than me blowing to this microphone. I'm not going to do that because we all know what that sounds like. It's like, and uh, that's actually a pretty unique signal. That's you can track that, and we actually track the strength of that signal, and uh, that's used to articulate and change basically the gain on the on the signal that's uh, being synthesized. So nothing's pre-recorded. Everything is synthesized right off the phone and software. Um, and then accelerometer is mapped to um, is mapped to vibrato. So when I tilt it down, you kind of automatically get this vibrato. You can actually change the vibrato rate if you tilt it uh, left or right. Um, so I'm going to try to play a little ditty. Uh, this is uh, I'm actually playing kind of um, a. Uh, a next a version two of Ocarina is Ocarina Two, and this one actually shows you how to play different songs, and also gives you this backing track that kind of plays along with you. So, waits for you so you can kind of just hang out here and there's and the idea is that you know didn't want to pressure people into playing at a certain speed or a certain tempo and they just play at their own rate at their own leisure um, and let me see here's another little duty I really like to play um, it's actually from the 2008 Olympics. It's a, it's a little song called You and Me. First songs we oh, well thank you very much. <laughs> um, 
when first designing the ocarina, like, what was going through my mind, I was like, man, this is like such an esoteric instrument, you know, who's going to know what, what an ocarina is? And so, you know, I did some market research, which, which is to say, I like went on YouTube and just like looked up ocarina and see what people were doing with it. And, uh, and I found like a lot of, there are actually a lot of people doing stuff with ocarina. One of them is Doc Jazz 4 That's his YouTube handle. He's actually, you know, he's teaching people how to play the traditional ocarina. And, you know, his videos have like millions of views, but all the ones with millions of views were like of video game music. And most of those were like of, you know, from Legend of Zelda. So from that, I was like, you know, hey, thanks to Legend of Zelda, the Ocarina of Time, you know, uh, how many people have, pl have played that game? Oh, right. Well, good for you. Those of you who haven't, I, I can highly recommend it. Especially one of the, you know, best games of all time. And from that, you know, people kind of know or think they know what an ocarina is. Well, half the population, I think, thinks that the ocarina is actually like this mythical instrument that really only exists in the land of Hyrule. And, uh, but it's actually been around for like thousands of years here and it's one of the easiest instruments to, to make. So, um, so we kind of made like, you know, these teaser videos for the app and that was, uh, one of which was the Legend of Zelda theme song. <laughs> And uh, that when, like, you know, after we launched it, um, the second day, this Nintendo uh, blog picked up on it. It's like, whoa, there's this, like, dude playing, like, blowing his iPhone playing the Zelda theme. And that kind of, like, snowballed from there. And then um, in four days, the Ocarina, like, went to the top of the charts and, and like, was like, oh, my God, this is, like, sh you know, wonderfully surprising and shocking. But people now, you know, for a few weeks, the world was like playing ocarina, um, and uh, ooh, actually, I'm going to switch audio back to the computer. Let's see. And uh, this, and we also for like a different demographic, we launched this other video. This is more of a test on like the age of like iPhone users. This one also got a lot of views on YouTube, and uh, and a lot of people refer to you know us as like those like dirty hippie iPhone users. Um, so we're sitting on this rug with this like crystal ball in front of us, and, and uh, I think that's where like the concept of making pot smoke and apps kind of came from. And uh, I'll talk more about that later, maybe. Um, so uh, let's see now, but that that's not all to the uh, ocarina. Oh, sorry. Um, we good? All right. Sorry about that. All right. I'm good to go. Um, Ocarina is also built as the social instrument. Um, let's see if I can get the network to work. Potter theme song. So this is coming from Louisiana, from someone called I Am A Machine. Here's Springfield, Missouri. Ah, someone from Europe. Very 
sparse minimal music here. Josh from I see maybe Copenhagen. Oh, that sounds like Star Wars. Um, so this is a. listen in on, on people playing their iPhone ocarinas. For the first week, pretty much like 70% of what you heard was Amazing Grace because that was the only tablature we had on our website uh, for this. And it was kind of like uh, kind of the stairway to heaven of the ocarina. You know, you go into guitar shops and there's like no stairway. And uh, for the ocarina, it was like Amazing Grace. And there's a lot of people, oh, wow. So this is kind of, you know, the, the roughly the design of Ocarina. So it's really trying to take advantage of all these sensors. Multi-touch, microphone, accelerometer, but also GPS and networking. Um, and trying to think of this, this iPhone as really, as this thing that is not, not just really any computer, but as something that is very much um, a technology that is part of us, for better or for worse. It's kind of this extension of of kind of our everyday lives. Um, and that was kind of the the thought in designing Ocarina was, you know, how can we make something that really fit into not concert halls or stages, but really everyday life? Because um, that's where, like, most of these things are. Is it's, that's just, it's the most pervasive personal computer we've ever had, and, and because of that, the most personal computer we've had so far. Um, and a lot of people then, you know, took to, to YouTube. There's something like 10 million Ocarina users now. And a lot of them love to just play for the world, something we also did not expect. Um, one such person, oh, I need to switch audio again. Whoever's up there, I thank you very much. They're like running back and forth. We good? I think that's a thumbs up. Yeah. Here's a, a user. Um, this is why I love the iPhone. <laughs> it's really great when people, if any, if even one person does what you hope that they do with something that you make, but for them to like do something like so unexpected as to play this thing with their nose um, was like really cool. Uh, she was actually a winner in this contest when she eventually had of like the Ocarina This Contest Blows YouTube video contest. Um, and uh, we sent everyone like some prize money, a t-shirt for her. We also sent her like a box of Kleenex for her troubles. <laughs> And, uh, and and that leads me to something else I you know really feel very strongly about is that you know technology well should create calm and, and this all I think can be traced back to uh, Mark Weiser and his crew at at, uh, at Park uh, 20 years ago when they're working on pervasive ubiquitous computing um, they seem to like somehow pro like there were profits in that they kind of kind of saw this. Revolution. Maybe they didn't think of it as smartphones. They thought everyone would have these, these things that knew your location and they had these very portable things that kind of you can communicate through. And that he thought the technology doesn't need to be in your face all the time. It's something that could help us work for us, um, do stuff without being in the way. In fact, it might might as well be invisible. Um, and so this idea of the technology, even though it's, we have more and more of it around us. They don't, we don't need to be more and more aware of them. And in fact, you know, technology maybe could be, you know, in, in our active consciousness, doesn't have to be so active, it could be more passive. Um, and, um, and so with this feature, um, we actually got this comment <coughs> on iTunes. Uh, 
I'm just going to read it out. It's my piece on Earth. I'm currently deployed in Iraq, and hell on Earth is an everyday occurrence. The few nights I may have off, I'm deeply engaged in this app. This globe feature lets you hear everybody else in the world playing the most calming art I've ever been introduced to. It brings the entire world together without politics or war. It is the exact opposite of my life. Deployed U.S. soldier. So uh, this is from 2009. So reading this, we're like, oh, man. Um, you know, that's, you know, to, to uh, have potentially, like, you know, reach someone in this way is something that, you know, we were very grateful to have the opportunity to do. Um, it also, frankly, makes us feel, like, really safe making software as opposed to, you know, people who are in wars, like, around the world. Um, but I think that is a role of, of technology in that it, it, it is something that balances kind of things that we kind of balances our logic in some sense, you know. Um, it kind of is, you know, it's like I think perhaps all art, something that is neither logical nor illogical, but kind of that balancing force. And, and I think technology, you know, has always played a role in the arts and uh, for art to do that very thing. <coughs> and, uh, and Mark Weiser also, you know, said very famously that the most profound technologies are those that really disappear. They weave themselves into the fabric of everyday life uh, until they're indistinguishable from it. And speaking of that, we actually, we have an app for that. Um, this is MadPad, and it's, it's not a musical instrument, but an, instru but an app that lets you make musical instruments out of snippets of your daily life, whether it's, you know, soda cans, a dollar bill, a uh, traditional musical instrument, uh, and your, your, your dog. Um, and so here's a quick demo, video demo of it. project in a uh, class at Karma uh, by Nick Krug, and uh, eventually go and went on and, and made this full-fledged app and product, um, which then Smeal published. Now, when you look at all these things, there's, you know, there's, there's this quite interesting trend of how technology, you know, is changing our lives, especially in the last hundred years. Um, before, you know, actually, interestingly, before, like, say like 100 years, maybe 150 years, without kind of this advanced like communication technology of like radio, recording, all that, people actually, I think, made more music. Um, you know, it was kind of like one of the, a popular family pastime. Apparently, families got together after dinner instead of watching TV because there was no TV and didn't invent it yet. They kind of played music together. You know, people don't really do that anymore. And uh, And before, you know, to hear music, you either had to make it or had to be around someone who was actually making it. There was this undeniable live component to music making. But, you know, um, along came this wonderful technology of, like, radio, broadcast, of recording. That, you know, they're, they're magnificent inventions, but at the same time, they have this byproduct and the side effect of making music making kind of, of backgrounding it more and more so. Um, and kind of giving us this culture of like a few producers of music to many consumers. Um, and, uh, and technology in some ways, you know, that's of all the good things it did, it also kind of had this side effect, um, which is more dubious, I think, in nature. But undeniably, you know, technology is, is going to march on, pass, you know, goes from this passive experience, this interactive experience, and now this socially interactive experience. Um, 
But at the same time, I kind of believe that, you know, now there's a chance for us to actually use technology to kind of turn the tides back, to actually get more people to play music, to be more creative, uh, and to connect through their expression uh, with other people. And, uh, and that's, you know, kind of one of the goals of the research that we're doing at Karma. And it's one of the, the missions of the apps that Smule makes. Um, I'll briefly just show you a few more things. Uh, I think I'm running a little low on time. Um, so here's Leaf Trombone. This is kind of a successor to Ocarina. You kind of blow into the phone. You play this ridiculous miniature trombone. Um, kind of, But it kind of teaches you how to play different tunes. Um, and uh, we kind of ran across this problem of like grading people of how well they played. It seemed like just a regular scoring system didn't really do it justice because some tasks are just inherently difficult for computers. For example, you know, you can ask a computer, you know, um, you know, what pitch is that? Okay, we can we can do that. You say, hey, computer, how expressive was that performance? We still we still can really. That's still an open problem. Uh, furthermore, to say, you know, to be able for a computer to say, you know, that performance was like epic. You know, that's a notion that's that's easy for humans. You know, when we hear something that's epic, we're like, man, that's epic. But computers don't really got that. You know, they're still, we're still working on that. But so there's certain things that are inherently difficult for computers, easy for humans. You know, um, a wonderful example is you know is capture. In fact, it's this whole idea that captures are based on is that some things people are really naturally good at doing. Computers really hard for them to do, like recognize what, you know, letters are embedded. This is actually early captures. I actually find, interestingly, that of late I am more and more, like, unable to, to actually decipher captures. I don't know if anyone else has this experience. <coughs> um, here's another captcha. It doesn't have to always be in that form factor. Here's one where it's like, you know, please prove you're more than a mindless spam bop identifying who gets the beer, which is at the center of this maze. For a computer to be able to figure this, you know, what the intent of this is, it would, you know, it's an open problem. I'll give you like 10 seconds to figure out who actually gets the beer. All right. A, I think. <laughs> Amazon Mechanical Turk. You know, with Amazon is dubbed artificial, artificial intelligence. It's... This is a really cool use of technology in that technology doesn't actually solve these problems. You have something you need done, like proofread my paper, you know, identify, you know, deals in coupons for getting buying this item on the web. These things is still <laughs> are kind of these uh, intelligence tasks that are really hard for computers still, but people are naturally good at doing. Now, the, you know, kind of something like this that crowdsources people. It does just that. It brings people together to then use the computational cycles that's in people, and then pushing them to uh, to actually do these human intelligence tasks, as it were. So we face this kind of use this idea to create kind of the world stage for the leaf trombone, and uh, where you know if you play something, we actually have used other users judge you on how good your performance was. Um, so the whole ecosystem was one where people come in and, and write music for the leaf trombone. It gets published to the app. People could come in and perform. When they perform, they can choose to upload it to the world stage where this is online, real-time collaborative judging that's happening. And people could basically give you comments, emoticons, and uh, be like encouraging or sarcastic, um, and also give you kind of a score. It's kind of like a democratized like American Idol for leaf trombone. It's kind of a ridiculous kind of a concept. Um, and these are emoticons you can like give people as they're listening to their performance. And the three judges are doing this all at the same time. <laughs> at the end, you give them a score and more comments. And then you know, the users can play this back. Um, it turned out this worked. <laughs> we had 6,000 users. And this app is no longer available. For the short time it was, you know, 6,000 user-generated songs that everyone could play, 700,000 performance judged, had an almost a million users. And, uh, you know, these are among the most amazing graces always up there because that's like a song we always just have on hand to package with the app. Um, 
Um, but then you look at usage by the most prolific. Now, this is the one end of the bell curve is that, you know, there's some people with a lot of time on their hand. One guy published 177 songs to the app that suddenly everyone can now access. Um, the most prolific performer performed 2,639 times on the world stage. The most prolific judge judged 10,000 times. <coughs> and each session is like two minutes. We're not paying these people. You know, they're just kind of like, you just need to set the ecosystem in motion. And again, like just like ecosystem of the mechanical Turk, I think if you can kind of balance things with technology, you don't have to, you don't have to solve all the problem with the technology. You only have to help people solve the problem. And the technology simply just kind of like nudges and puts the right pressure on the crowd um, and things happen. Um, we also have a mobile phone orchestra. With, we wear gloves for amplification in our hands so we can stay mobile and amplified. Uh, and um, we give concerts, but also we experiment, as you saw in the Converge piece, um, with having kind of like performances or compositions that aren't taking place in the same place or by the same person or at the same time. Um, there's, you know, also trying to make other apps for these bigger these bigger guys um, the magic piano I'm just going to play you a little ditty here I think you can probably hear it without me plugging in um, let's see some, some uh, Joplin Scott Joplin let's see if I can focus this Ragtime is really addictive to, to play, so uh, um, but you can play this really at any rate. You can, so uh, it's really kind of up to you. The the, the score is kind of baked in, so um, and uh, I've I've actually turned on no fail mode. Otherwise, if if I weren't actually hitting the right regions roughly it would actually detune the piano it's actually a piano that would like on the fly detune um i guess it's, it is a magic piano after all um and then we have the magic fiddle for this i will need to switch audio <coughs> and uh, i'm going to pop one of these cough drops while i'm doing that if anyone needs a cough drop i have like 10 of those up here so uh just let me know uh, so the magic fiddle was kind of like a the result of a uh, of kind of this bad bet I made with myself pretty much. I was walking out of a performance by the San Francisco Symphony and uh, you know I was just like, man. Wouldn't it be funny if we made an app that, like, kind of, like, forced the users to put the iPad up to their face? That'd be pretty funny. Ha, ha, ha. And a few months later, there's, like, Magic Fiddle. Um, it kind of looks like this. You can see these lines that come into this. Uh, it's a pretty string fiddle for whatever reason. And this region here is the bow. Kind of pluck it down here, and this shows you how it tells you how to play. So I'm gonna try to play this. The, uh, the synthesis for this is that it's all synthesized, but unlike the ocarina, violins are notoriously hard to physically model. Um, so this isn't really like a, this isn't so much like a magic fiddle as it, it is kind of this uh, nostalgic thing for like learning an instrument for learning the violin or having a neighbor that's learning the violin that's what it that's what it sounds like to me but here we go like 
out of tune. Just like a real violin. So, uh, you know, I think without the uh, possibility for, like, complete debacles, you know, there's also not the reward of being expressive. I think as part of the equation for building expressive things is just giving at least some measure of, uh, you know, ability to fail. Um, let's see. How am I doing on time? I've got like 10 more minutes. <coughs> okay, feel, feel free to nap or like, you know, um, escape. Um, <coughs> I think we're all, we're almost almost through. Um, Smil also uh, recently made a thing called Auto Wrap. Um, I'm just going to show you the, a, a video I did for it called the uh, Stress Test, and featured one of my favorite all-time um, personalities, Cornholio from Beavis and Butthead. But I, I become Cornholio. Yes. Oh, hold on a minute. Uh, switching audio back again. Thank you. This is the AutoRap stress test. Here we're going to put AutoRap through a process known as the Cornholio test. The idea is that if we can AutoRap this, we can auto wrap just about anything. Let's go to it. I am the almighty bum holy yo. My bum hole, it speaketh, it says, tick it, Apologies to everyone. Let's auto wrap this. I am the Almighty Amoyo. I am the Almighty Amoyo. I am the Almighty Amoyo. So that's auto wrap, and um, and uh, it's actually created by uh, the Kush team, who recently joined the Smule family. Um, <coughs> and uh, it's a, it's a really fun app. The, what you heard was actually like completely not edited or processed audio. That was the output. I mean, we did like six takes, and that was the take that you know every time is a little different. Um, but it's you can you can get some interesting uh, results out of this. Um, Oh yeah. Well, that's. I should also show you uh, a few more things tomorrow. You know, I don't think I can embarrass myself. Well, I, I could always embarrass myself more, but. Here's a video we made for a uh, magic piano. Jeffrey will probably recognize the location. It's right behind uh, Stanford.
see. Um, oh. Also, um, before I move on to the next thing, I do want to give you a quick demo of this guy, which I forgot to do earlier. And this is actually, um, um, goes back to the laptop orchestra. This is a instrument that was created for sing synthesis. Again, all the sound we're going to hear is synthesized right on the spot. It sounds like a really mechanical singer, just because it kind of is. Um, there we go. When I squeeze the trigger, it starts singing. It doesn't get tired, so you can sing as long as you, you know wants. Now, if you move it to the different corners of the this 2D space, you get different vowels. If you move, it smoothly interpolates between them. Kind of like gently putting your hand into someone else's mouth and then shaping it, the vocal cavities to, you know, produce these different uh, formants and hence these different vowels. If you twist it, you get vibrato. There's a volume control here. You can make it breathe. And then uh, combined with the uh, the keyboard, you can make it you know sing different different pitches. Uh, let's see, sing really low. Or rather high. So, you know, that's a, I think this kind of goes back to my earlier point where um, sometimes ex expressiveness, you know, sh does and maybe should trump realism. This is not a realistic model of a singing voice. We all hear that and we're like, that is not natural. That is not a human voice. But you can, that doesn't mean you can make it expressive. And I think this is kind of a, you know, sometimes realism is important and sometimes, you know, you can really just focus on making it expressive because when you make it expressive, you know, I think that's that's where the possibility of musical instruments really arises. So, um, let's see, moving on. Uh, then there's T-Pain. Uh, we made an app in collaboration with T-Pain called I Am T-Pain. It's supposed to transform, like, every person into T-Pain. It <coughs> auto-tunes your voice. Um, and uh, just like the ocarina, people kind of have taken to the streets, you know, seeing I'm T-Pain making videos of themselves. And so in some sense, kind of the earlier picture of people going on the streets playing musical instruments is in some weird, twisted way being realized in, in, you know, in this fashion. Um, I'll show you one video, you know, two of our users made, which is part of it. The, the new BBM is sick. This is called I'm, Dude, I'm on a phone. I am TV. Okay, 
Okay, you get the idea. There's, you can see this on, on the internet, and uh, yeah, I mean, like, the opinions expressed in this video do not necessarily, you know, represent, you know, that of Stanford or Smule. Um, but for better or for worse, these are, like, you know, a big part of our users, and they're a big part of, you know, the future population in the current and future population of this planet. Um, and I think it's through these apps that we, uh, that we actually meet a lot of them. Um, in, I'll close with a few few thoughts, um, and uh, this this has again going back to do uh, has to do with uh, human computer interaction. And uh, you know, Ben Schneiderman uh, said the old computing is about what computers can do, and the new computing is about what people can do. And I think that's the luxury that we have now, when computers have gotten so powerful, so pervasive. Um, they're everywhere, and uh, they're more affordable than ever and more powerful than ever. And, and we, maybe, you know, some decades ago, uh, the pioneers of, of computing had to really become, you know, experts and really figure out what, you know, how to do, basically be a, do things on the computer's terms. Whereas I think right now, we still need to really understand what, how computers work, those, you know, especially those of us that are writing software or building hardware. Um, but we can we can do it for the end user for the people and figure out what it is that we want them to do rather than you know how to actually get a computer to do something so i think there's a certain luxury that we have but it's also a certain i guess responsibility for us to think about you know technology not for technology's sake but you know what we can do with technology um, one last example is um, is uh, is from the Sing uh, app, actually, this one is back when it was Klee Karaoke. Um, and uh, in 2011, in the wake of the earthquake and tsunami disasters in Japan, this user posted this thing on Facebook. So she started this rendition of Lean On Me. And in this app, you can actually invite other people to sing along with you, like total strangers. So she started this, and people then saw this and joined in and then got other people to join. Um, until it was like a couple of thousand people seeing this together uh, at different times, but kind of all um, accumulated in the Smule server, and you kind of hear this massive, haunting global chorus of people singing Lean On Me. And this is when there were like a thousand users. Now there's like 5,000 users. And these are complete strangers from all over the world. So I think this is um, this is probably a good good place to to maybe uh, for me to, to end on. It's um it's kind of the mission all along was to kind of figure out well you know part of why we do what we do is to kind of bring music making back um, to to the masses if you will. Um, there's an opportunity here I think with technology to to lower the activation energy required for for people to start making music. And as I said in the beginning, I, I don't believe there's quite like a, a point, a quota, where we were like, okay, that's enough music. You know, I think even if each person play music, and they don't have to play music necessarily for anyone, if they just even played music for themselves, I, I, I believe that's like a really good thing. Um, so if we can use technology to kind of encourage people to make music, um, I think that's a win. And I think for me, it's, 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 I feel like you kind of got to do it not like in your face. You got to just do it in more subtle ways. And so this is why devices like these, these iPhones or these Android devices, these smartphones are great because, hey, if, you know, so many people just have it with them or know someone that have a device. And, uh, and also if you design apps where, you know, they don't feel like, you know, something that's that's like a chore or something that's, you know, it seemed like maybe even a game to begin with. But if it's expressive, then by the time people are already making music, it's like too late. 
you're already being expressive, you're already being creative, and, and that's, that's all right. Um, so that's one half of it. The other half, of it, I'd say, is kind of, is this type of thing, is, you know, um, thinking about what types of new instruments or musical situations, you know, can we come up with that's previously not possible? Um, might we not make instruments that require collaboration from like a hundred thousand people and where the input from each person is is important um, is crucial um, what would such an instrument look like sound like um, what kind of music will we make with it um, so there's you know there's this kind of component that tries to go back to the past where we made a lot more music um, but also there's this component where we're just really curious as to what kind of new music we can make. So uh, I think that's, that's, that's all I've got for now. I want to thank you very much for listening.